Thanks a lot. Um, good morning, by the way. Um, I'm a little bit jet lagged because I flew from California. And uh, this is the exact route I actually took several days ago from San Francisco to uh, Copenhagen and then to Brussels. And you know, when I think about like commercial flights, I just, we usually think that, hey, you're going through some security and then getting on the plane, flying, you know, eventually like getting some drinks, snacks, and landing and leaving the airport, right? But if you, the reality of commercial flights is actually more complicated than that. Like it's so complicated that as a frequent flyer, I actually am appreciating that, um, you know, even the you know, cancellations and delays, like it, there's so much going on and um, there are zillions of things that need to go right in order for them to fly me from you know, San Francisco to Brussels. And I actually, as a customer, like I don't really have visibility to what is going on. So uh, my experience was more like, hey, I arrived at you know, San Francisco airport, the airport was functional, uh, the security was still working, uh, you know, I went through security, they you know, validated my ad identity. I spent some time you know, waiting for my plane, everything like traffic control was working, like no planes were crashing over us or whatever. Uh, the gates were working, the announcement system was working, um, you know, they started to announce that they are boarding and I ended up like boarding the last. We closed the doors and, you know, I got on the plane. Um, so our pilots probably went through all these like different checklists and I assumed that they were all green. And uh, they pushed our plane, traffic control allowed us to leave just slightly earlier so everything went well. And finally we were just, you know, flying. Um, we use all these like, you know, different facilities. Um, I, I mean, just imagine like all this stuff that you are engaging when you're flying and that, all the facilities that you are actually using, but none of these facilities are actually reserved specifically for our flight, but they are really essential for our flight to happen. So I had a comfortable seat, whatever, good food. Um, I actually flew and engines kept working. Time passed quickly. We actually ended up landing in uh, Copenhagen and I went through the uh, border and you know, made it to my connecting flight and landed in Brussels. Um, so anything could have been wrong, right? Like including the details, I don't know. And imagine all the like ground staff, staff the flight staff, the machinery, the electronics. Everything involved, and as well as the, you know, the border enforcement. So it requires a really complex system of you know, cooperation uh, to fly somebody from San Francisco to Brussels. And it's not always, you know, the things are not always good. Things may go wrong. As I said, that there are cancellations, delays, whatever. Different components of the system may fail differently in isolation. And we sometimes don't re even realize the existence of these like small subcomponents until they fail because we don't really have like visibility as a person who is flying. I don't have a lot of visibility into you know commercial flights. Um, may, well, you don't really appreciate a lot of good things because you just assume you just don't have a lot of visibility. For example, if you return you from the border when you were trying to you know, get into the Schengen area, you wouldn't appreciate all of a sudden like, hey, all this stuff until now like worked out fine. You actually were promised to be flying to Brussels from San Francisco, but you eventually had to like return back earlier. Anyways, like any computer system is actually like flying. Our users engage with a really tiny part of the stack and that's their experience. So um, your billing infrastructure, for example, may work so well for the most of the time. But if a user transaction doesn't go through, it doesn't mean like that's the end, end game, uh, end of the game for that particular user. So let's talk about a little bit about, about our everyday computer systems. So I don't think that like we have a lot of visibility into our stack. Um, and I don't really think that like everybody thinks that they scale in terms of both development, you know, maintenance, and generally the production experience. If anybody thinks that they do, I'm really impressed. Like I work from, you know, I worked at so many small and large companies and never thought that we did. At my current company, I kind of feel like we do, but there are so many small gaps here and there. Today's talk is actually about like how we are trying to fill those gaps. So by the way, uh, I'm Jana, I work at Google, and um, I had opportunity to work on a bunch of projects, including 
contributing to some of our infrastructure projects. And I have several stories about my time at this company, and this is one of them. So, you know, the early days of a company or a project is really nice because uh, things are simple. You often usually have a sing simple server and a few other components. Like you maybe have a Postgres uh, cluster for your data. But everything is just kind of like fitting into your brain at this point. Your architecture is just like a few nodes here and there. If somebody joins to the team, you're just taking the person to the whiteboard, explaining them what is going on in a couple of minutes. If there's something going wrong, you can take a look at the logs and, you know, it's easy to debug things from the logs. And then the next step, you know, you're growing, you have more engineers. Uh, the company culture is also changing because your monolith is not really, you know, helping you organizationally to scale. Some teams want to, like, you know, push um, stuff to production more often. Some teams just want to, you know, keep things more stable. So there are different demands between different teams. And, you know, this is, this is the point that you want to do something else and, you know, breaking down your big monolith. So the growth is great, but um, you started to see the first symptoms of actually, like, diversifying and fragmenting your tech stack. Uh, you start to include more stuff. You have like more storage, more DBs. You have like different, you know, queues or whatever. Each team is kind of like, you know, coming up with their own ideas. And everybody is sort of like siloed and not really talking to each other. And you have this like huge mess because all the, you know, the monolith um, organization is gone. And this reality is coming with a lot of new uh, challenges because, you know, just this one single problem just became many. And you can't really depend on the earlier ways of doing things, especially in terms of debugging. Uh, you can't really, you know, self-document all this stuff end to end because, you know, it touches to a lot of teams and there's no coordination between these teams. Um, and, you know, reading the logs is just so hard because some stuff is here and there and some stuff is there, like everything is failing in isolation or maybe just working well, whatever. You just don't understand the overall state of what is going on. And your engineers just really don't know what to do when things fail. You know, who is who's the person that we should contact? Like, everybody's kind of like escalating stuff to each other because it's hard to pinpoint what is the root cause of the problem. And sometimes it gets larger, like for some large companies, it becomes really intolerable. Um, like, the companies like mine, it's actually such a big pain. And, you know, a lot of people have been asking me, like, who really wants to work for such a large company? This was my biggest concern uh, before coming to Google. I work for another large company, and I just didn't want to, you know, take the job because oh, it would be a nice opportunity, but I will be feeling so unproductive because it will take me a lot of time to learn the stack and our systems. So in some cases, like, people think that, like, key people like Jeff Dean might be the answer to all of these problems because, you know, these people have been around for a long time. They have been, like, there when um, initially all these conversations were happening about, you know, critical parts of the infrastructure. They sort of have, like, a better understanding of things end-to-end, -end, but is this our really, like, our strategy? Are we, you know, keep escalating things to Jeff Dean? Nobody does that. And, you know, Jeff Dean actually went to AI uh, but maybe this is partially why he went to AI because lots of people are still coming to him and like he's trying to just basically replace himself with AI, I don't know. <laughs> so anyways, <laughs> to, to be more realistic, like it, especially, you know, very fragmented in large uh, systems, everything becomes such a big mess. Uh, we have all these different services, different, you know, storage systems, different DBs who actually has invisibility. Um, at some point, you know, this is the typical meme we had at Google, like we just need to delete all of this stuff. We have this huge complexity, um, the code is owned by different teams, you know, nobody knows what, how it works end to end. Uh, people who have been around for a long time actually have been burned out because they became the canonical source of truth and they can't really take vacation because if, you, if they, you know, just like take two weeks off, everything just goes south. Um, and don't, you know, the documentation is not an answer to any of this because documentation doesn't really can catch up with the change. So, you know, docs always lie, like they're always like coming late, like, and you really don't want to depend on docs. So uh, when I joined this company, 
on my first hour, like literally it was my first hour, they were like, hey, there is this thing called code search. This is an internal tool. It's, uh, it's, it's called code search. Uh, it's basically a search engine for our internal monorepo. It's really amazing. It's just really, you know, the r ranking and everything is so easily. You can just really pinpoint to stuff. But the only problem, the restriction is, you need to have an entry point. You need to, you know, know the symbol name, whatever, like the file name, or some sort of like entry point, project name, maybe user name. Um, you can actually see the history as well. So it's actually nice if you have an entry point. I s use this every day, and everybody at Google uses this every day, especially if they're engaging with the monorepo. But it's partially why. Uh, we can understand better uh, about our systems. The second thing is we have this unified build tool, uh, which is called uh, Blaze, uh, which inspired Bazel, the open source version. And since everybody is using the same build tool, it kind of makes things easier because you can actually like take a, you know, click on a build target. You can see who is dependent on this build target and everything. Like, but um, this is really good for static dependencies. Uh, it doesn't tell you anything about your dynamic dependence, like service dependencies. So this is really cool, but it's not the, um, the actual solution. And none of these tools are really good in capturing like, what is important in terms of pointing out to like, the most critical execution paths. Uh, you know, this is a typical system that returns some user profile images and a bit of metadata. And um, there are many services here. There are many services, you know, we're going through some services and like as well as some storage in order to, you know, return a response to the user. But the blue line is here um, what we call a critical path because the user request comes in to the load balancer and hops through like a certain path in order to serve this request and, you know, all the way down to the low level disks and at some point we actually have a response. Um, at my company we actually put some emphasis making these critical uh, execution paths more visible. So, you know, engineers can actually see, investigate, and debug. Uh, if, you know, engineers can really see this type of execution path, uh, they, they can also see what exact comp components were required to serve that request. They can also uh, run some, like, analytics on, like, what type of, like, execution paths are important or what type of, like, service dependency is around. This requires, you know, some sort of like dynamicness. It's actually generated uh, by data coming uh, from the uh, dynamic instrumentation in production. And it's a bird's eye view, you know, for our systems. You can really understand the service dependencies and what paths and what dependencies and what relationships are more important. So just like my flights, you know, our users don't often know much about under the hood. They don't know what is going on in our systems. They really, ex you know, expect this big black, black box to respond, them, respond to them. They don't really care about the health or the availability of this underlying stuff either. They just expect and, you know, a response. For example, if the user service here, one of the replicas just dies, like just crashes, and uh, the scheduler just spawns a new one in the you know, lifetime of a request. And if the user cannot really tell because the latency was not that high, like, the user wouldn't care. So you know, being able to think about your systems from the perspective of um, critical paths are really important because the goal here is not the availability of these like, different individual components. The goal here is the availability of the a user execution path. So some of the goals um, are the goals of critical path analysis. Uh, as I said, the availability of the underlying processes doesn't really matter at all. It's more about like having the uh, user experience up and running, having that critical path up and running. And it's just kind of like flying, right? Like I, I fly, but I don't really understand what else is going on. I know what I engage with. I don't care if the airport is entirely functional or not. I just want to use one gate. Maybe I will just you know, sit and eat. I just really engage with a small section. And from my perspective, that's what matters. So being able to you know, think, about our, think about our systems and evaluate our systems you know, from the user perspective is a very different approach, but it's really useful. So some of our engineering practices are really around uh, discovering critical paths automatically. And I briefly mentioned that we do this in production. Um, and 
once we discover these critical paths, we also, you know, use them as debugging tools, as debugging data. Uh, we want to make them, you know, more reliable, as fast as enough. Um, and if there's an incident in production, the data provides us some debuggability. We can just go in and actually see what has happened. Um, you know, if it's the middle of the night, if you're on call, you just really want to be able to see everything end to end without knowing too much about the entire system, even if you haven't, you know, read the source code before. So that's cool, you know, how we get there. Um, there are different ways to do this, actually. We um, talk about, like, two main emerging tools in the industry nowadays. I don't know if you are interested, like if you are familiar with distributed tracing or event collection, but login can also be used. Uh, the tricky part of login is, you know, it needs to be more, it needs to have more context about the execution path. You need to like carry a request ID around and uh, you need to, you know, structure maybe the log messages in a way so you can generate these execution paths by uh, looking at parsing the data. Um, so, this is a very common way of like, you know, understanding a problem, just keep asking why, like being able to ask why, 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 why. Uh, it's kind of like this golden rule of exploring, you know, cause-effect relationships. So the, the granular, you know, event collection or distributed tracing has this promise. It's kind of like, hey, we want to give you this ability to be able to go deeper in the stack and try to, you know, like help you what actually happened. Um, this is why people sometimes say observability is uh, about having answers for questions that you ha haven't had yet. Uh, because, you know, the question appears when there's an incident or there's some unlikely event. Um, and you should have planned to, you know, collect enough data. So if the incident is there, you, you should be able to take a look at your debugging data and should have answers to your questions. So. I will show you uh, some illustrations of like some traces. I don't know if you are familiar with tools like Zipkin or like your network tab on, you know, developer tools on browsers. Typically traces look like this, like, you know, there are a bunch of things going on, but each row here is representing a different component. Uh, some different action is happening. It captures, you know, this is uh, what happened here and like how much it took and like, where it actually initiated that. And uh, here, what we see is, uh, this is a trace for an API server I have. So um, for slash timeline, you can see all these like different server components that I actually had to like go um, and make RPCs to in order to respond to the user. So you can take a look at these, you know, rots uh, to learn more about the lifetime of a request. Like if somebody, for example, new joins to my team, and if they're going to work on the API server, they can take a look at the trace to understand, oh yeah, this is all this stuff, like they don't have to read the code. They can start with looking at the trace and learn uh, what is going on. So also, you know, welcome to 2019. This is the basic stack we have. Um, it's like ever growing number of layers. And maybe you have more understanding of your user space, but everything underneath I don't know, what I called cloud stack, which is like Kubernetes, whatever. It's just a big black box, and we absolutely have no understanding. Just imagine if your infra was providing some, like, you know, granule events or traces from that layer uh, in the lifetime of your request, if there's something relevant, it would be so much easier for you to understand. Um, imagine some of the, for example, Kubernetes scheduling decisions are leaked into the, you know, the networking layer because load balancer need to understand the scheduling decisions. If we can actually, like, you know, capture some traces from that layer, wouldn't it be nice if there's an, you know, unlikely event, unlikely like scheduling decision, you will be able to just go and like take a look at your user trace and like pinpoint, hey, it was the scheduler or the load balancer because of this reason, this happened. Um, so. We, we, there's no way that we can learn this entire stack in our lifetime, but I think that this type of like debugging tools allow us to understand more of each layer. So this is a, this, uh, traces are a cross stack, you know, debugging tool. You can basically use them to blame whose fault it is. Um, returning back to that like API server thing, just imagine that, you know, the engineer just comes in, and takes a look at like all the, you know, we waited this much time for the scheduling decision to happen. 
So, you know, that person can escalate the issue to the scheduling team because, hey, like there's this additional latency, but it's actually not my fault. Um, so it kind of gives you this like, you know, git blame for production issues type of functionality, which is really nice. Um, and it's really nice when your cloud providers are participating into your trace because what you can see is, hey, there's all this like additional, you know, latency coming from the cloud pro provider's uh, load balancer. Maybe I can escalate this to so their SRE, and this is the evidence. Uh, because each time you escalate stuff to cloud, cloud providers, they're a little bit like, hey, are you sure that it's us? Like, so, hey, here's the data, and it's the proof. Uh, the other thing is you can actually, it's really nice that um, you can build some tools to map this type of data to the source code. Um, here, for example, each bar, you know, each span, is representing an RPC call. Um, so it would be nice to just, you know, take it to the RPC, maybe, you know, the handler or uh, to the client uh, source code. So you can take a look and just basically, you know, review what has happened, uh, especially, you know, it could be a you know, misconfiguration or a malformed payload um, or some sort of like a stupid you know, timeout configuration that there was some additional retries or latency. Uh, so it's pretty cool to be able to do that if you build some additional tooling around this type of data. And the other thing is, you know, who to call? You know, there's an issue with this specific component. Um, I am not the person who can understand. I read the code. Um, I took a look at like all the additional data, and I don't really know what is going on here. Who's responsible for this? If you have a catalog of you know different teams, uh, if you can map one of these blocks to a team, to an SRE team, or a regular team, you can actually give them a call and like try to understand what is going on in production. And the other thing is, you know, give me all, all the other stuff you know about this block. Like in the lifetime of this block, what else has happened? Because we don't capture a lot, everything in, you know, in forms of traces or something else. Uh, would be nice to just, you know, see what else is going on. Um, a very typical example for this is, you know, just the logs because we already have logs everywhere. So just give me the logs. Like what happened? I just want to, you know, understand more of like, you know, granularly what happened. So um, nothing comes free, unfortunately, and I will explain some of the challenges. And uh, I think we shouldn't undermine the level of investment required to roll some of these technologies in your organizations, especially if you already have an established organization. It's a little bit harder to you know, put these in. And this is where people usually got stuck uh, especially if they haven't thought about these capabilities and some of these challenges early um, in the early days. So if you need critical path analysis, it actually is a cross-team problem. So the entire organization needs to agree on a bunch of things. Uh, they need to agree on, you know, they, you need to do some instrumentation in order to be able to generate that, that data. You need to be able to collect those like, hey, this is the start, this is the end, whatever but you need to just be able to reconstruct the trees. So you need to like really propagate some request IDs around. And there is not like a lot of um, agreement on this, like there is no like golden standards or whatever, even though um, for distributed tracing, at least there's a W3C proposal coming up. Uh, but apart from that, like there is actually no real standard. And just imagine that um, even if you internally understand, like even if you in, inter, internally agree on one particular identifier format, you are hopping through these different you know, load balancers or whatever, and they don't really understand that format. So we really need an industry format for that, and for distributed tracing, we're actually working on, one of, uh, on a standard. So that's really good news. Uh, the other thing is engineers really don't know where to start. Hey, like we can capture a lot as a part of traces or event collection. Um, we usually say that, like, hey, start with your network stack, specifically HTTP and RPC. And this is actually where things are getting really easy because if you have a framework or if you can start things with the load balancer maybe, um, you just get, like, some automaticness. Um, you can, you know, for every RPC or every request, you can just automatically generate one of these bars 
and um, you know gen um, you can e e simply you can simply start by um, using an instrumentation library that works well with your existing frameworks and gather some data from there. The other thing is uh, infrastructure is still a black box and none of the vendor services are really designed with these type of capabilities. Um, you know, nobody actually considers about these capabilities in the first place. We still expect people to learn a lot about the underlying stack by reading the code, docs, you know, talking, and we don't expose this type of like you know debugging information, and it's it's becoming it, it is it's a it's a huge challenge, especially if you are you know running stuff in managed environments um, in your cloud provider, for example, uh, you know serverless like function you manage you know function running um, environments where you basically do not have like a lot of like control and. Uh, if the environment itself is automatically providing this type of debugging information and you can participate into that, that would be so nice. Uh, the other thing is, you know, instrumentation is really expensive, high traffic systems really, you know, end up downsampling and um, it's, a, it's a huge topic, you know, what kind of downsampling strategy makes sense. And we sometimes miss, you know, collecting data for interesting cases. And we want to just improve this over time. And we only have like a few brief, you know, ideas what to do. And the other challenge is the dynamic capabilities of instrumentation has been, you know, has been underestimated for a long time in the industry. And this is really important because we want to be, ideally want to be able to tweak things. We want to be able to collect more maybe if there's an issue. But doing it in a safe way is not really easy. Um, so. There is, you know, this is still a big challenge. You need to have your own strategy. And to kind of like wrap up, we are still kind of in the dark ages when it comes to like understanding and maintaining our systems. Uh, when I talk about these concepts, you know, I just feel like I'm this snake oil, you know, <laughs> salesman just traveling and like talking about these concepts. But I, I have to say that like we have some sort of like, you know, some of these abilities actually, um, at my company at least, and it really helps us, it, you know, makes your engineers slightly more happier uh, because you can give them an overview of what is going on, but at the same time, you know, this is not the end game, um, it's just an overview, and it really just changes the way you interact with other teams and everything, uh, but it's just a, you know, entry point tool, not the, um, the entire solution. So I just want to, you know, say that like this is a tool that really closes knowledge gaps in our organizations, and uh, we don't talk about it. I think I came here to talk about it, um, and I would love to, you know, answer your questions if you have any. And thanks much for having me here. Be quiet when entering, be quiet, yeah, and remain seated for now. Hi, Anna. Um, you said that the, you're not aware of a distributed tracing standard. I, that's why I understood open tracing to be that standard. Can you explain maybe why that doesn't fit in with this? Or um, is The question is uh, open tracing is a standard uh, or... Um, I mentioned like the lack of standards and how open tracing is not like kind of like aligning with that. Sorry that to interrupt. Question? Again, about respect of the speakers and their time and their commitment, can you please be quiet? Thank you. Uh, so uh, the question was, was the question, uh, I mentioned that there are lack of standards, that there are no, not a lot of standards around, and you mentioned open tracing. Um, so the question is, is open tracing not a standard in, in like kind of like, you know? Okay, so open tracing actually provides some hooks to instrument things, but it's not open-aided about like, you know, the propagation standard, or it's not open-aided about the data you export. So, in, uh, and you need to like, so each provider has a different, they uh, is enforcing a different data export format and a header format. Um, and if you're using open tracing, you need to like link the entire system 
with the um, one specific, you know, implementation of open tracing, so you can have like end-to-end -end stuff. Uh, this is not like practical, for example, if you have Nginx as a binary, you know, Nginx just doesn't know much about whatever, you know, tracing provider you want to use. So uh, we want to make this less of a build time constraint, but more of like a wire format so everybody can understand the same header and produce similar type of data. Um, so, you know, nobody actually like has to rebuild stuff in order to have traces. I hope that that answers your question. Hi, Anna. Um, my question was, uh, can you go into a bit of details of what you meant by dynamic, uh, uh, un dynamic constraints? It, w yeah, dynamic capabilities. Would you, would you have an example to elaborate this? So one of the typical questions is like, how much data should I collect? Or, um, you know, how granular should it be? Or um, sometimes we collect distributed traces, but it's not enough. Like, we just need to go and enable some other stuff momentarily. Uh, for example, uh, it's a very common thing at Google that, hey, we just don't know, like there's some additional latency here. It turns out sometimes ended up being the GC latency. And in order to capture that, like you actually need to have some runtime events coming from there. And it's not like really, you know, in the scope of distributed tracing. So you just need to go and like tweak a few other things and, you know, enable some more instrumentation and need to be able to correlate in a way with that distributed trace so you can still capture that like, hey, this is what has happened in the lifetime of this. Um, so that's kind of like what I mentioned. And again, it's, it's a huge topic. Um, it's more about enabling more signals, maybe adding more granularity, maybe adding more debugging information, uh, maybe you know, adding more like granule other stuff. Um, it's all in the scope of dynamic capabilities and we just don't really think too much about it when we're developing things. So yeah, it's, it's something that is not very ideal nowadays. Hi, Anna. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, you were mentioning uh, freeing ourselves from like build time constraints and uh, stuff like Nginx and, and, and things like that. Uh, do you think that we can ever uh, automate uh, this sort of dynamic instrumentation given that it seems to require at least some degree of domain knowledge that at some level has to be input by humans? So the question is, um, if we have some, maybe sort of, some sort of standards, is it possible to automate all the distributed tracing? Uh, by you know putting this in our load balancers, nginx, um, or you know in in similar stuff. Um, so there is you know you can actually start a trace, but you still need to you know propagate it all across in your stack. Uh, that still becomes a problem. Um, you we can just generate the RPC level the entry, the ingress you know maybe um, request span, uh, but you still need to you know just put the right header to the outgoing requests and all the other stuff need to, you know, align with that and sort of like participate into that to have actual, you know, any, any meaningful traces. So it's not really easy to do this, especially in uh, language runtimes where, you know, um, for example, for Go, it's really hard because you need to be in the runtime propagating the right identifiers. In some language runtimes, it's like so much easier, especially if there's one single thread or you can just really put the context in the thread. So it depends on also the language, you know, the language uh, and some sort of like, you know, capabilities and limitations around that. But it's, uh, the actual answer is unfortunately no. There's no like super automatic magic way. Hello, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, yeah, here. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so you've mentioned that infra is still a black box. Uh, do you think that uh, things like open compute is the way to go to solve that problem? Or anything like that? Like oh, open source hardware? Did I mention, uh, can, can you repeat that again? Yeah, so do you, you mentioned that infra is still a black box. And do you think like, uh, things like um, open compute is the way to go to solve that problem? I'm not really familiar with open compute, but um, lots of infrastructure builders really really want to like expose this type of data once there is a real standard, like an export for like standard, for example. They want to provide like a hook or whatever. Um, they will just write it like in in a whatever particular format, and they want to be able to expose and they want to really like work with the user trace. 
Uh, it's just like the more of like this like lack of you know wire standard at this point that they are nobody's interested. But I, I want to take a look at open compute book because I don't have much context about it. Maybe we can uh, chat after this. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, is it any projects uh, like going on? You mentioned the guy going to AI. Do you try to to implement some AI machine learning technology to get like okay we have some problems and it's analyzed and then some suggestion where it can be. So the question is: Is there any AI work related to consume this type of data? Yeah. There's actually a lot, uh, especially in the like scope of anomaly detection. They want to be able to automatically say that like this this pattern, this usage pattern, this pat pattern is not really normal, there's some additional latency or like different components or you know, additional number of retries and everything. So they just wanna use um, some sort of like, I, I don't a lot, like I don't understand what they do at this point. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time reading, uh, but they wanna do some better you know, recognition of unusual patterns uh, by you know, looking at the data. Thank Sorry? you. Oh, thanks. <laughs>